Good morning, Trinity Church. How are you? Is there anybody who loves Jesus in the house today? Come on, can we put our hands together for our Lord and Savior? Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise him. Aren't you glad that he loves you? And I'm just, I'm, I'm honored uh, to be in this house today. Uh, I've heard so much about Trinity Church. It's my very first time to ever come here and to get to be here and see it in person. But I've heard much about and have much respect for your leadership, Pastor Jim and Becky Hennessy. And they are making a difference not only here in this house, but through this house, in this community, literally impacting the entire world. God has raised them up as choice leaders uh, to, to raise up leaders because there are a lot of powerful voices that are coming from this house. Can you say amen to that? And so I just want to take just a moment to honor them and to say thanks to them for allowing me to be here. But would you show some respect and honor right now? Just put your hands together for your leadership. The Hennessy's, thank you so much, pastors. If you are watching, I'm grateful for this chance to be here. And then uh, Pastor Jeremy, you know, just, just kind of referencing a bit of our, our friendship. It's mutual. I'll just say the same things about Pastor Jeremy. Uh, but he, he's just one of those guys who is just too legit to quit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's just for real. He's a real dude. He loves God. And uh, he, he loves people. And I see that when I watch his life. He is someone that God has raised up to speak to all kinds of ministries, but most of my interaction with him has been through youth ministries, so I know he speaks at youth conventions and youth camps, and God's given him a powerful story and powerful message, and uh, so much love to you, Jeremy. Respect you, bro. And uh, then I'd, I'd have to say as well, my brother Robert Madu. I mean, he's, what's really cool is that while I'm here this week, he's speaking back home at my home church. So I'm here, he's there. He spoke at a youth convention yesterday where my, my children were part of the youth convention. So last night when they were uh, calling me, they were telling me all about it. And they said, oh, and, and Robert Madu was preaching and this is what he said. And so love uh, Robert Madu as well. But one more time, can you just recognize the leadership of this house? Come on, all all of those who serve here. What a great church that you are a part of. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk to you today about why I love the church. Anybody love your church? Do you love your, tell your neighbor right now, I love my church more than you do. Go ahead and tell them that. I love my church so much more than you do. I just love the church. Uh, before I jump into this message, though, I, I'm going to give you something. I know it's going to bless you. Uh, I, I'm going to show you a picture of my family only because I know you want to see them. Okay, so I'm going to do this. not for me. This is for you. Here's my family right here. Notice how we needed the entire screen to fit us all in. That's my beautiful bride, my best friend, Casey, along with our six children. Stretch your hands towards me and pray right now. Six kiddos. You notice all of them are boys except for the five girls right there. People, when I say that, they think I'm slamming my girls. Like, I, no, listen, those are my princesses. I love my girls. Uh, I just needed a, a little more uh, male representation, and so God sent us Jordan. So Candace is the oldest. She will turn 17 in two days and then stair step all the way down to Jordan, my buddy, the champ. He is five years old and ready to take over the world. All right, let me tell you a quick story because I got all kinds of stories about my kids, but I'll tell you one that will help. Uh, just frame our talk today. So Angel is the one there in my lap with the bigger than life bow that she's wearing right there in her hair. So that is Angel. And uh, she is just, um, she is outspoken. I'm trying to think of positive ways to say this. She is verbal. Uh, she, you will never have to wonder what she's thinking. And so a lot of times, usually, I'll have one of my family members with me whenever I'm traveling and speaking. And so, uh, you know, whenever I do, a lot of times the pastors will just say, hey, how was it in the kids' area? You know, or, or what would you think of the services? And I always love it when my kids give feedback. 
unless Angel is with me. Because I don't know what she's going to say. You know, I just know what she's going to be like, your kid's area stinks. That's what I, I just never know what she's going to say, right? And, and so she's, she's outspoken. But I love she's going to change the world. We just had words over her life, how she's going to be a messenger for the Lord. So I'm believing that in Jesus' name. And so I'm excited about Well, one day, Casey walked with Angel into a Christian bookstore, and there's a picture of Jesus on the wall there. And so Angel was, I think she was about three years old or so. I don't remember exactly about the time she was looking at the picture of Jesus, and she was just staring at the picture of Jesus. And my wife was like, oh, what a beautiful moment. Angel is fixated on Jesus. Not even looking around the toys, Bob and Larry, Veggie. No, 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 not, not my daughter. She is just engrossed with a picture of Jesus. And so Casey walked over and she said, oh, sweetheart, do you like that picture right there? And Angel said, mm -hmm, yes, ma'am. She said, do you know who that's a picture of right there? And Angel said, mm-hmm, that's Cy from Duck Dynasty. So you know you got work to do as a parent when your child doesn't even know the difference in Jesus and Cy. You know, you just need some serious, serious help. Well, of all the stories that I could share, just to tell you a little bit about my family, I share that one because how many of you would be in agreement with me that there are a lot of people in this world who have a wrong picture of who Jesus is? You ever try to tell somebody about Jesus? They're like, oh, you're one of those. Oh, I've heard about you. Oh, I, I've heard about Jesus. Or you try and tell them about church. And they have something framed up in their minds that's not an accurate representation. Or they will say, oh, I tried Jesus. How many guys know that, that when you, you try Jesus, he's never going to disappoint if whatever you tried didn't work, you didn't try the real thing because Jesus always works. But, but I find that. And in our culture, we're, we're living in a time to where just the perspective or their understanding or their picture of the church is so distorted. Some of you have been around long enough to know that there was a day when the church served as the backbone of a community where the church was just a, a hub, if you will, of, of society and a place from which all of, of just life would flow from. The, and even people who did not regularly attend or, or regularly worship God, they still had a reverence and respect for the things of God. But times have changed. Now, there are many who would want to marginalize the church like just keep it out of the way and not a part of the, the heart of the conversation. There would be even people today who would want to mock the church. There are even those who are uh, full of hostility towards the church, who want to bash the church. The, the, it used to be a date where I would get on an airplane and when somebody said, what do you do? You tell them a pastor, it turns into this awesome conversation. Now I got to like hide it. If I want a chance to tell them about Jesus, I just got to get creative. You know, I talk a lot, you know, whatever I'm going to say so that they don't just shut me out because there are a lot of people, they find out that you go to church or that you're, you're a follower of Jesus and they will just shut you out. Show of hands, how many of you know what I'm talking about right now when I say those things? Then I would suggest that they have a wrong picture of what the church is all about. And I would even say, while there would be some who would say the church is on the ropes and its best days are behind us, I would say, no, 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 no. Jesus is the one who said, this is written in red in the Bible. How many guys know when it's written in red, that's what Jesus says, so that's the show enough, show enough, right? I mean, it's all good, but when you see us in red, pay attention, right? And Jesus is the one who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's going to build his church. We don't have to be worried or concerned like, oh, I remember when the church used to make a difference. Oh, I remember when the church used to have a voice. How many guys know that when the night is the darkest, the light is the brightest, the best days of the church are ahead of us in Jesus' name? Come on, put your hands together today if you love the church. Well, so for some of you, as we strive to like paint a picture of why we love the church, this may be new information. I don't know where you are in your journey with Jesus. Maybe you were just driving by today and you thought, I'm going to go in there and check out this church. Maybe you're here because your wife kept nagging and saying, you need to be in church. Uh, maybe you're here because your mom and your daddy made you come to church. I don't know where you are in your journey with Jesus. Maybe you just need a, a, a reminder or a refresher of what the church is all about. I'm going to give you just a few thoughts today, and it's not going to take super long, but I believe that the Lord's going to use it to encourage you today. And I just want to talk about why I love the church. Point number one, if you're taking notes, I think that's cool. If you are, you can write it down. It's this. I love the church because, number one, it's the house 
of God. I love the church because it's the house of God. Listen to what the psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 26, verse 8. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. I get that. I can relate to that. I'm a church junkie. I just love going to different churches. While I'm on staff at a church in Oklahoma City, on, on just about any given weekend, I'm in a, in a different church and, and speaking at all kinds of churches, and I just love going to the church because it is God's house. David said, Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Listen to Psalm chapter 84 and verse 10. I love the vivid description here in this message version where it says, One day spent in your house, this beautiful place of worship beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. I'd rather scrub floors in the house of my God than be honored as a guest in the palace of sin. Anybody can say amen to that? You just love God's house? Now, I get it that God is omnipresent. What does that mean? That means that God is every all the time. So you never have to feel like you have to say, man, I would like to talk to God. I think I'm going to drive up to the church and get an appointment. You don't have to come to this building or to a church to talk to God because God is everywhere all the time. As a matter of fact, some of you know that firsthand because when you have a near miss or a close call driving the car, you talk to Jesus really quickly, right? You're like, you are here. Be here, Lord. I need you right now. So we understand that God is everywhere. But there's something special about God's house. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because just when you drive past this place, you may not, it may not even be a Sunday. It may not even be a day that something's going on here at the church. But when you just drive by, you can't help yourself. You got to you gotta kind of turn over and look because you just know this is God's house. Do you love your church? You know it's no driving by it. Why? Because this represents something. This represents that for many of you, it is the place that you found hope. It is the place that you started your relationship with Jesus. For some of you, this is the place that your marriage was restored, that God brought healing to your home. For some of you, this was the place that you were introduced to the freedom that's found in Christ and you were delivered from chains and bondage. And so when you think of God's house, you cannot help but smile because you love the house of God. There's something special about coming together with God's people in God's house and lifting him up. Have you ever noticed how much the devil fights you to try and keep you from getting to God's house? Anybody ever noticed that before? Is it just me or do you just feel like Sundays are some of the most crazy, just hectic, chaotic mornings of the whole week? Have you ever noticed that? is as if all of hell is trying to keep you from getting to the house of God. You wake up and the clothes don't fit right. They do the other days of the week, but not on Sunday morning. And the toast is going to burn. May not happen other days, but it's going to happen on a Sunday morning. The kids are fighting. Maybe it's a couple you're fighting. Come on, let's get real. You drive into church. You're mad. You're, your blood pressure is climbing. You're running late. You're telling, quit fighting. Right, stop that. I will rip your arm off and beat you away. We're going to the house of God. Bless the Lord. You know, you just feel all of this like, ah. And then you get here, and you're like, good morning. <laughs> so good to be in God's house. You know, it's just like, man, I was just fighting to get here. You, you're trying to get dressed. You, you got spiritual warfare going on in your hair. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Haven't you ever stopped to think, though, for a minute, wait a minute. This, this happened last Sunday, too. Wait a minute. This happened the Sunday before that, too. Come on, can't we connect the dots? The devil is going to try and fight you and keep you from coming. You just got to make a decision and a priority. You don't wake up on a Sunday morning. Here's one of the craziest questions you could have, ever ask yourself. Am I going to church today? Why would you ever even ask that? Come on, man, the doors are open. God's presence is here. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come on, praise him if you love God's house today. It's a priority. I can't wait to get Why? Because let's just be honest. Some days when you come in, you're carrying stuff. You're carrying stuff. So when you're coming to church, you're crawling to church. 
I just got to get to God's house. Why? Because God's presence is there in a unique way. He says, enter into my gates with thanksgiving. Come on into my courts with praise. And as we start entering into the presence of God, what happens is the presence of God invades our own lives, our own circumstances. You know, you've been there before where you come in and on the, the first song, man, you want to sing, but man, you just, you just don't even have it in you. You know, you just you just kind of there, and as they're singing, and then second song, you didn't mean to, you didn't even notice, but it was just like, what in the world? You look down, and your toes just starting to tap just a little bit. You it was involuntary. I mean, it just started going, and then by the time they hit, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, man, you got hands up. You don't even care who you're hitting around you. You just swaying, lost in the presence of the Lord. And all of a sudden, you realize no matter what I was carrying, no matter what I was facing, I know that God is with me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Being in the presence of God, it changes things. You don't have big problems. Some of you are like, yes, I do. You don't know me. I got big problems. See, one of the things about coming to God's house surrounded by God's people is sometimes their faith starts stirring your own faith. And as the worship is being sung and you're reminded of the words and these promises about who God is and how big he is when you are realigned and, and refocused on how big God is, you realize even when you thought you had big problems, your God's a bigger God and God is so big that your problems aren't a big deal to him because he's greater than, right? It's all relative. So I'm not saying that you don't have challenges. In this world, Jesus is one who said, he said, in this world, you will have difficulty. But aren't you thankful he didn't stop there? He said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We come to his house to declare that he's the God of miracles, that he's the overcoming God. And so we fight to get here. We fight to come into his presence because we know that when we do, things happen in the presence of God. Do you love God's house today? Let me give you a second reason of just why I love the church. It's not only God's house, but secondly, number two, it's a house of healing. This is a house of healing. Every single week there are countless people who are facing storms and challenges and trials and difficulty. And there are people who come in here with hearts that are so deep that no medicine can touch it. And hearts that are so broken that no surgeon can put it back together. And so they would be diagnosed or they would be communicated to as if they have no hope. As if there is no cure as if there is no counselor who can talk them out of what they've gotten themselves in. But when you come to God's house, there's healing in this place. And it might be good for me to clarify that when I'm talking about getting to this house of healing, this place where healing flows, I'm not merely just talking about the, a building as if when you just walk into your, uh, the, the building, you just walk in and it kind of just gets on you and takes care of everything. That would be silly if you ever went to a hospital, right? And, and as you walk in and you needed something treated and they say, just stand there. Just let it get all over you. You're in a hospital. Everything's okay now. How many guys know that would be weird, right? You're like, no, hey, anybody got a doctor in here? You know, I just need something. And so whenever the team comes together, they all have their role. They start, somebody's checking your blood pressure. Somebody else is taking your temperature. Somebody else is asking you questions. Somebody else is getting this ready. Somebody else is getting this. And they come in together. How cool would it be if we started seeing that this place is a place where hurting people can come, but I'm not just expecting for them to line up on their own and come in by themselves, but instead I recognize that when they come to the church, I am the church. Tell your neighbor right now, you're the church. We are the church. When we're talking about the church being a place of healing, we're talking about God wants to bring healing through you. You think about what comes through the doors by way of burdens and cares. And we're not just saying, yeah, just come on in and let it just get on you. We're saying, man, when you come in, Jesus is going to love on you. Jesus is going to bring healing. And I believe that God can work through me to bring that hope and that healing to you. Listen, fellas, you never know when there's another guy who comes into this place and he just got some crazy news or some heavy situation. Maybe he lost his job and you're standing there at the door and, and you've got a firm handshake and you just say with a smile, man, I'm so glad to see you today. Welcome to God's house. 
See, when we start talking about playing roles or playing parts, sometimes we feel like, well, what real difference can I make? I mean, that's something for the pastoral team, or that's something for somebody on the worship team. But God wants to use you. Somebody say, God wants to use me. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 16. It says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. God has a work he wants you to do. God wants you to be a, a change agent, a healing agent, a conduit of his power for his power not only to work in your life, but through your life. You have a role. And sometimes we think, well, what can I do? Man, I, I can't work with the young people. I'm, I'm allergic to teenagers. Come on, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know there are people who are just like, man, they freak me out. <laughs> and you know, once I survive those years, I promise to never go back. Okay, I get it. But maybe you can work on the worship team. Maybe you can serve on the worship team. You're like, no, man, I can't sing. I can't sing at all. If you just even heard me trying to sing in the shower, it's bad, man. I, I can't sing. You don't have to do that. You can serve somewhere. Can you smile? You're like, for how long? Well, just long enough to shake a hand. <laughs> then you can go back to frowning if you want to. But you don't know what kind of a difference you can make when you just are used of the Lord. Listen. Ladies, you never know when a single mom comes walking through the door. You don't know what she is carrying to get here. You don't know what the circumstances are behind her feeling like she needed to get to this house. But when she comes in and you meet her there at the door and she's loaded down with 16 diaper bags and a stroller, you know, and kids in tow. And, and I'm used to that world. That is my world, right? I told you, six children. So I know that scene very well. And she's coming in and you meet her there at the door and say, oh, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm waiting for you today. Here, let me help you with that. Oh, you've got some winners here with you who are looking forward to our kids. Let me walk with you and show you where to go. You take them in. You get them checked in. The, the lady sees that somebody cared enough to come and get it all cleaned and prepared so that it was on track and on point when they walked in. Warm, friendly, caring, godly people to receive. Come on in. This atmosphere is fun. It is happy. How many guys know the church should be the happiest place on earth, right? So the kids go in and they find a place, and then you walk back with them. Do you have anybody to sit with? Why don't you sit with me? I'd love to introduce you to some friends of mine. And then you sit down and you look over, and in the service, you notice that the mom's got tears coming down her face. And you think, oh, God must be moving. And she's just thinking, no, this is the first time I've had free child care all my life. She just moved. <laughs> then she finds out we have two services. She's like, yes, Lord, I'll stay for both. Y'all going to keep them back there? <laughs> back in the kids' area, there's some man of God who recognized that this is God's house where God's healing flows, not through the walls, but through God's people. So he's back in the kids' area, down on a knee, talking to little Johnny who got there. Who knows what little Johnny brought to church that day? Maybe no one's ever, maybe a grandma brought him because he's never had a mom or a dad who spoke life over him or said, you have value or purpose. And there you are looking at little Johnny in the eye and saying, dude, you know what? I was praying this morning that God would send somebody really, really cool today that I get. And look. You showed up, man. Oh, let me feel those muscles. Oh, man, you got such strong muscles. Man, you were amazed. By the time you get done speaking, like little Johnny's walking out of that place, you know, his mom's coming out. She's been blessed, you know. It's like, Mom, we got to come back. This place is incredible. As a matter of fact, I met somebody in there. I'm his only friend. If I don't come back next week, he's going to be alone. Little Johnny's been blessed. Never underestimate how God wants to work through you to bring healing in God's house. And sometimes we can get stirred in our hearts, but then we have a confrontation with reality when that starts looking practical on how we're going to go about that. Because some will say, Scotty, do you realize that if I was going to join the worship team, did you know that they have to get here like 30 minutes early? 
man, I'm lucky to show up on time, and you're wanting me to join. I got to get there early? And Scotty, you, you're talking about me being on the, on the uh, parking lot or the first impressions, the hospitality team, and, and getting out there and holding signs and waving or, or afterwards helping people find their way. Do you realize that sometimes you won't get out of here until like 45 minutes after the service is over? Do you know how many people get ahead of me in line at the restaurants if I were to do that? As if what we're suggesting is that God wants to use you, he wants to work through you, and it's going to cost you nothing. He just wants us to be excited about easy service. Man, when I played football, you could always hear, I'm talking in a loud stands. I'm talking about over the band, over the cheerleaders, over the screaming. I could always hear my mom. And the reason I could always hear my mom is because as I would be running the football, my mom was the one screaming, sit down, don't let them hit you. (laughs) If I was running the ball and a guy was coming towards me about to hit me, my mom would be the one screaming, run out of bounds. I'd come home after the game, maybe scraped up knuckle, a little blood on an elbow or something, and she'd say, let me see that elbow. Let me see that. And I'd show it to her. She'd say, did that happen on that one play when that boy hit? Yes, ma'am, that's when it happened. Did you not hear me tell you to run out of bounds? (laughs) Actually, Mom, I did clearly over the entire stadium. Actually, I did hear you saying that. But, Mom, that's not the point of the game. Wouldn't it be strange If I was there before the game started and the other team walks in and I'm like, who are these guys? What are they doing here? Well, that's the other team. What are they trying to prove? I'm trying to score a touchdown, but they're in my way. Some of you guys are going, that's a weird, that's goofy, that doesn't even make sense. I know, because I expect them to try and stop me, but my point is saying, you can't stop me. I'm going to score anyway. I don't care what you try and do to keep me from my goal or where I want to be. Why is it that when it comes to the church, we talk about what we want to do, and then when there's a little bit of opposition, we go, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to run out of bounds. The devil's going to try and keep you from finding your purpose, from carrying out his healing. He's going to try and get you to be like, oh, I got to get there. Oh, I got to stay late. But I don't even like the play that they're calling. Or somebody didn't appreciate what I did. Well, may the Lord help you. It's going to be okay. We will have all of eternity to enjoy the rewards of faithful service. Right here, right now, get in the game. Be used of God to bring healing to people. And when there's a little bump, a little confrontation, refuse to be denied. Do whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord. God wants to use you. Don't play it safe. Don't try and make it easy. Make it count. I'll give you this third and this final point, and then we'll get ready to wrap up. But I love the church because it's God's house. It's a, it's a house of healing. And number three, it's, it's a house of hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. For far too long, the church has become known for everything that we're against. A lot of people have this wrong picture of Jesus because they've had introductions to who he supposedly is by people who are more looking to fight or as if God needs somebody to defend his reputation. Quick news break. God was God before you and me, and he will be God long after us. He is great, totally capable at defending himself. 
He did not call us to fight the very people that we are called to love and to reach. It is difficult to reach somebody with the hope of Jesus Christ in the middle of a fight. God wants us to build bridges, not burn bridges. He wants us to bring hope to them, bringing them into God's house. And the way that we do that is by showing them the love of Christ and what hope looks like by watching this life right here. I know that for some of us, when you think of like bringing your coworkers to church, you're like, bring them to church? I don't even like hanging out with them at the office, and I have to. Man, they're obnoxious. They get on my nerves. Some of you, you get so worn down, and I get it, and I understand, but you get so worn down because you go to work, and, and man, they're gossiping, or they're using foul language, uh, they're, they're, they're talking ways and saying things that just, it grieves you, it, it bothers you, and it gets, gets you just upset, and you just dread it, and it frustrates you. I mean, can I just remind you that people who are far from Christ tend to act an awful lot like people who are far from Christ. And instead of being shocked, instead of being bothered, instead of being offended, what if we were broken? And what if we realize that that's the reason perhaps that God sent us to that job? It's not just so that we could go there, but so that we could build a bridge to bring them here. I can't wait to go to heaven. Anybody looking forward to heaven? Like for real, you're looking forward to heaven. Come on, no more sickness, no more pain, no more heartache, no more disease, no more loneliness, no more depression. Come on, I cannot wait. If it's not on your bucket list, put it down. Hang out with Jesus forever in heaven. Some days I'm just like, Lord, today would be a great day for the rapture. Anybody relate to that? God, if you can find a trumpet up there, could you blow it? Just right quick, today would be a great day for the rapture. But I'm reminded, even in my most difficult of days, that the reason my heart is still beating it's because God wants me to bring people to Jesus. Because we understand that we are the church. What if God wants you to reintroduce a world to an accurate picture of what Jesus looks like? So that when they look in your heart, they look at your life, it's not that the rain never falls on you or your family. It's just that because you are filled with this confident hope, you're still singing in the rain. You're still celebrating even in the midst of the fire. You're still dancing through difficulty. And when they see that, they are perplexed, not because you won an argument, but because you lived with hope. And as they begin to question you and inquire, you're able to be one who points and says, don't look at me. Let me show you the source of my hope. His name is Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. And you can experience the hope of Jesus Christ. Listen, found people find people. People who have discovered hope become carriers of hope. And I love God's church because that's who God has called us to be. Question for you. What if every single person in this house was as passionate about Jesus as you are? What would this place look like? What if everybody in this house was as generous as you are, what would this house look like? What if everybody who called Trinity home was as committed to serving as you are, what would this house look like? And I just pray that as we get ready to turn our hearts toward heaven to respond now to him, I pray that there's just something inside you that's been ignited, that you're reminded of how amazing, how wonderful, how glorious God's house is, and the role that God's called you to play in it and to bring people to it, and that your heart would respond wholeheartedly, yes, Lord, because I love your house. 
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes before I give us a chance just to respond to that? I realize that in this place today, there are some of you that for whatever reason, you find yourself in God's house today, but it's not because you're a follower of Jesus, not because you're passionate about God's house, just whatever practical circumstance that got you here, it did, you're here. Maybe you've never been to a church before in your life. Maybe it's your first time to walk through the doors of a church. Maybe at one time you were walking with God, but life has happened. Things came up, and you kind of got off track. You've gone your own way. And and as you sit here today, if you're going to be gut-level honest with yourself, you'd have to acknowledge, man, I am not right with God. I want you to know that we're thrilled that you're in God's house. And more than anything, God wants to fill your heart and make your heart his home. He wants to take your sin and remove it as far as the east is from the west. You say, Scotty, you don't know all the junk that I've done, man. You don't know all the mistakes that I've made. You don't know all of the dirt. You don't know, man, it's embarrassing, it's shameful, it's disgusting. If people knew, man, they would just think so differently of me. I want you to know God does know. Yes, he does. But because he knows, it doesn't cause him to say that he's mad at you or turned his back on you. God brought you here today. He welcomed you into this house. Whatever means brought you here, I want you to know that was God's plan for you to be here. Because he wants to know, he wants you to know that he loves you. That he's standing here with arms wide open, ready to receive you. If you would just say, God, I need you. Please forgive me. Here's the story of the gospel. It's a simple story, but it's a powerful story. All of us, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us deserve heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Bad people don't go to hell. The only people who go to heaven are the people who have allowed the grace of God to pay the price for their sins instead of them paying for their own sins. The only people who go to hell, the Bible tells us hell was not created for you or me. It was created for Satan and the demons who rebelled against God. The only people who will go to hell are the people who refuse God's free gift of grace. They refuse his love. They they refuse his mercy. And I want you to know today that the story of the gospel is no matter where you've been or what you've done, God sent Jesus Christ, his only son, to die on the cross for your sins and mine. He came from heaven to earth to die so that we could live, so that after life on this earth is over, we will go from earth to heaven to be with him forever and ever and ever and ever in heaven. And whether you will go there or whether you won't is totally your call. I'm going to pray for you. The truth of the matter is you're one heartbeat away from never having another opportunity to have your sins forgiven. I don't say that to scare you. I say it because it's truth. You never know when you're going to draw your last breath, and at that point you've sealed your fate for all of eternity. Do you hear this today? And yet I want you to know that you are one sincere, heartfelt prayer away from having your life totally and completely changed from the inside out. You want a fresh start? You want a clean slate? You want a new beginning. You want to know that you know that if you die today, you would go to heaven. You can know that today if you just say, God, forgive me. I want to make you Lord of my life. I want to surrender my life to you. If you want to do that, I'm going to pray over you today. So when I count to three by just an uplifted hand, you say, Scotty, I'm not right with God, but I want to be. I need to commit or recommit my life to Christ. I want my sins forgiven. I want to go to heaven instead of hell. I want to make Jesus the king of my heart. Scotty, pray for me when I count to three without hesitation. I want you to shoot your hand up in the sky and just say, I need that. One, two, three. Come on, hands going up in every single section saying, I want to commit or recommit my life to Christ. Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you. You can put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. I want all of us just to pray this prayer. In just a few moments when when we end this, Pastor Jeremy will give direction for all that needs to happen. I just want the privilege of praying for you right now. For those of you that just raised your hand, you pray this prayer with me and you mean it with your heart. But everybody, let's all together pray this out loud. Dear God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Today I ask you to forgive me and wash me white as snow. Ask you to be the king of the heart. And the Lord of my life, from this moment forward, you're my everything. I've decided 
to follow Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's put our hands together and thank God for saving souls.